Hi everybody, my name is Quinn Nguyen, and I'm the president-elect of the California American String Teachers Association. I was also the past president and current treasurer of the San Diego ASTA section, and I'm also conductor at the Civic Youth Orchestra of Escondido. Um, I'd like to start off our classes with a topic on vibrato. So vibrato is known as the hallmark of beautiful and mature string playing. If you can play with a beautiful vibrato, you really etc and so on and so forth um, it's really something that helps us be expressive it's something when we first picked the viola we probably felt like, oh my gosh, that is the most beautiful sound ever. So the question really is, is how do we produce it and what do we need to do to improve our vibratos? So first things first, um, vibrato, there's a lot of different theories about vibrato, but the one that has stayed throughout time is the idea that vibrato is an oscillation of pitch going either above or below the note. And so the one that I prefer is one that's what we call at pitch or in tune and then goes flat or below pitch. So, uh, for example, if I was going to do a third finger, let's say an E, I start an in tune E here, and then that pitch would then go flat, and then it would come back into in tune. And with enough oscillations, we hear the vibrato pitch. Now, what would happen if we went above the pitch? Some people believe, oh, vibrato is both above and below. Then here's in tune, here's a little above, a little sharper. Back to in tune and then back to flat. And when you're listening to that, you might sing a certain pitch like, but if I play that E again, now you're realizing that the vibrato that you heard was actually sharp. So uh, there are reasons to use that above uh, vibrato. Usually, for example, if you're a soloist and you really want to spin your sound above the orchestra, then you would use that model. But for most orchestral playing, more most uh, chamber music playing, um, and just tasteful playing in general, you probably want to do at pitch or below. Now, um, vibrato is one of those techniques where you have to have almost no tension in your body. Um, and we will talk a little bit about where the places of tension are, but in general, um, if you are really tight and really clenched, vibrato is not going to be able to be possible for you, okay? Um, now, violas, I mean, there are technically four types of vibrato. There's arm vibrato, wrist vibrato, hand vibrato, and finger vibrato. Uh, but violas primarily um, use arm vibrato, and wrist vibrato and a lot of violists do say that you get a larger thicker richer vibration through a, an arm vibrato and a wrist vibrato is more um, associated with violinists um, when i was younger i used to always use an arm vibrato here and what we call an arm vibrato is where the main motion is being generated by the elbow opening and closing like this. I like to say it's, this is like knocking on a door, right? Um, and a wrist vibrato, of course, the forearm stabilizes and then most motion happens here from the wrist. So when I was younger, I used to always use an arm vibrato and then somewhere, you know, once I got a little older, just magically for no apparent reason at all, I switched to a wrist vibrato. Most people will start to gravitate towards one or the other, right? So I recommend is you try both and see which one is easier for you. Once you can get the vibrato motion, then you can go back and relearn the other type um, because it'll be easier for you to assimilate that once you already have a good model for that vibrato, okay? So um, let's start. With a vibrato motion, I'm gonna put my bow down for a second. With the vibrato motion, we're really looking to establish four things. First of all, we're looking to establish the range of motion in the joints. So for example, let's start with arm vibrato. How we might do this 
is we might put our wrist on the right side of the neck here and actually just go up and down, sliding our wrist up and down the neck. Now you can see underneath my elbow is going in and out. So therefore that's my arm vibrato motion. Now if I wanted to have done a wrist vibrato, I might have actually placed the inside of my wrist on top of the shoulder of the instrument and then just done this. And you can see I'm isolating this, my elbow, and I'm using only my wrist joint to produce this motion. Okay. So again, step one here, which is to get the motion from the elbow or wrist, you really have two options, either out on the side here or right there at the wrist. Okay. Um, the second thing you want to do is what we call notch gliding. And the notch can be said to be, if you look at your finger, uh, your index finger, you have one joint line, you have two joint lines, and then you have this third joint line. The notch is literally right there where the finger intersects with the base knuckle and it'll be right where your third crease is. Now, when we're doing notch gliding, the purpose of this is to let this slide up and down. I imagine this is covered in oil or something very slick and I'm able to go up and down easily. And again, uh, at this time, I'm not going to be squeezing at all, so the thumb is very relaxed and loose, and I have a good hold in my instrument with just the weight of my head. Um, I think that's one of the most important things. If you have trouble holding your instrument without your hands at all, you're going to have already a lot of trouble holding, um, sorry, not holding, but trouble with your vibrato because you'll want to hold onto the actual instrument when you shouldn't. So. Um, make sure that you always start with a great hold to begin with and then from there you can then go to step two and start doing some notch gliding okay so again I'm just letting my thumb just go back and forth feeling that notch go so this would be an example of an arm vibrato and I could actually just move my wrist and again you can see that my notch is able to move Okay. Now, the third step is I'm going to what we call fix the thumb. And in vibrato, there are two points that are stabilized, and one is that thumb. So I'll be doing is I'll be using this as an anchor, putting a little bit of weight there. And as a result, what's going to happen is you're going to see, for example, here's a wrist vibrato. My thumb is staying put, and my notch is able to slide just everyone. Again, right there at the base of the index finger, that's just riding up and down the neck. Okay. And I'll be doing these in rhythms that I'll be explaining in a little bit. Now, oh, I forgot to show you a little bit of uh, arm vibrato. So again, if I'm using arm vibrato, you'll notice that the thumb is quite mobile. Almost like it's disconnecting from the rest of the hand. But you see my main motion is right there in the inner elbow. And you can also see my thumb is fixed, but my notch is still gliding around. Okay, great. Right. Now, step four, we're going to fix the fingertip. Now, if you didn't know, the vibrato actually comes from this first joint on the finger. So uh, if, for example, I'm taking my other hand here, I can feel this unbend and then bend again like this, that first joint is where the vibrato sound comes from. This would be in tune, remember we're talking about at pitch and then below, so be in tune, and then when it pulls away, this goes flat, right? So this is the below pitch portion. So in tune, flat, in tune, flat, okay? So when I actually fix my thumb and I fix the tip of the finger while I still am allowing this notch to slide back and forth, what you're going to see, hopefully here, is that first joint collapsing and then recouping, collapsing and recouping. And again, my thumb is stabilized, the tip of the finger is stabilized, and coming down like this, okay? So this might be an arm vibrato, for example, 
and I can also, again, do a wrist row. Now, a lot of people do have trouble with wrist row. There's an uh, easy way to get used to this. Let's just take a little ball. And what you're going to do is place it right here on the shoulder. And what this will do is it will isolate your hand and therefore allow you to get some of this exercise with just your wrist instead of in your inner elbow. You could easily have done this like here, but the problem here is that the shoulder of the viola here does get in the way of the range of motion. So it's not quite as good as having a small racquetball or a tennis ball. Okay. So, uh, again, when I get the tip of the finger to anchor down, I'm still trying to get that notch to slide up and down. It's just the thumb has anchored and the tip of the finger has anchored. And as a result, Again, I'm looking for whether I'm doing an arm vibrato or whether I'm doing a wrist vibrato. Now, it should be said that if you're using an arm vibrato, it doesn't mean that the wrist doesn't move at all. It doesn't mean that the wrist is frozen. Remember, you want your vibrato to be tension free, right? It just means a majority of the motion is being done there. Um, and same thing with wrist vibrato. It doesn't mean that you might not move a little bit. Obviously, you can see some residual motion emanating from the elbow, but most of it happens from that wrist joint here, right? But you do see it a little bit here, and that's okay. That just means that I'm tension-free enough for the energy to flow through my arm, okay? Now, um, these numbers here represent divisions of a beat, and so what I'd like to do is think about a metro marking of, let's say, 60, which is like one, two, three, four, five, etc. So here's our beat. Now, if I were to do this vibrato motion with one either backward or forward motion per click, it might look something like this. And I'll use an arm vibrato for the sake of demonstration, okay? One, 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 one. Notice how that first joint is collapsing and then recollecting. Notice how my thumb is anchored, the tip of the finger is anchored, but the notch is actually able to glide. That's really important. Now, as I get faster, and by the way, this is what it sounds like. It's not gonna sound good. So. I can go to twos, right? So that's one, two. One, two, one, two, one, two. And again, remember to allow the tip of the finger to freely collapse and allow your notch to freely glide. That's very important, okay? Now I'll go to threes. These are what I call, well, they're called triplets, of course, uh, but I like to call them pineapples because the way we say pineapple is a perfect syllable representation of a triplet. Pineapple, 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 pineapple. So the trouble with triplets or pineapples is that you'll have a backward motion and a forward motion that are opposite of each other. So for example, if I do the slow motion once, I might start pineapple, and then now the next one will come forward. So pineapple, flat, sharp, flat, sharp. So they're opposing, and so a lot of people get confused with the triplets, uh, but just realize that every other one will be the opposite of what it was last time, okay? So here is triplets or pineapples. Again, let that index finger's first joint completely collapse and do allow the notch to feel completely free and gliding on the side of the neck, okay? That brings us to our final one of this series here, and I call this the beginning series because um, these are pretty approachable. You could probably learn them in about two weeks, I would say, um, and on each finger. So, fours, 
You can think like the word peanut butter, peanut butter, or pepperoni, pepperoni, whatever you prefer. So. What you're looking for in these first groups here, okay, as far as goals, one, two, three, four, is you're looking for an even vibrato. You don't want to be jerky like this. You want to have excess tension. So look for where you're squeezing too hard or too much or becoming stiff in a certain joint. Um, and also, you want to make sure that you're really being very even with the rhythms, okay? This brings us to our intermediate set. So sixes and eights are what I call the intermediate speeds. So if I divide that uh, second, which is one, two, three, four, into six, one, two, three, four, five, 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 six. And again, these are backward and forward motions like this. Right? Um, that's one exercise. And then, of course, eights would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 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 like this. It's hard to, to speak that quickly. One, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, and eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, and eight. So what you'll see down here in blue, you'll see the sine waves. So if you think about sine waves in math or science, they both go up and they go down and that completes the cycle. So if we thought about the idea that this vibrato could go at pitch, right, which is our up, and then flat or below, and then we went to back, that would have been a complete sine wave cycle. So, in fact, a group of six uh, backward and forward motions is actually three sine wave cycles. So, again, if this is one, two, three, four, and I'm thinking one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, I think one and two and three and 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 one, two, three, one, two, three. you can hear those three pulsations. So I like to think of them as three forwards, meaning going up to pitch, or three backs, meaning going below the pitch. So whichever you prefer. Uh, and then eights, of course, are just four cycles. So again, if this beat, one, two, three, four, I can think. Think of four sine wave cycles, okay? So now, uh, all of that did not sound like vibrato at all, correct? Uh, and you're probably wondering why we went through this whole slow process. What happens to the human ears, we cannot hear pitches that are faster than one-tenth of a second, right? So I was using the metronome of 60, which is once per second, and at eight, that's still larger than uh, a tenth of a second. That's technically 0.125, right? or 12.5%. If I go to 12, which is my next uh, category here, we're gonna see that that actually is below the tenth of a second. And this will be the first time that your brain and your ears are not able to process the sound waves that it's hearing. It's gonna actually interpret it as one experience. And so these are what we call the professional vibratos. This is on the slower side. Of course, 16s or eight full cycles is on the faster side. So let's hear what that kind of sounds like. And if you didn't practice counting in sixes and eights before, now you get your chance. So here's our beat. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five, six. 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 now you can hear the pulsations because I'm trying to make them obvious of six but you also if you really listen you can't hear flat and sharp anymore and that's because your ears are now functioning at more than a tenth of a second 
and it can't tell the difference between the two. It's just one experience. So again, this is a very systematic way of building up your robotic skills. One, two, three, four, sixes, eights, and then twelves. And finally, sixteens would be the very fastest one. So. Okay. I recommend doing those rubato exercises on your first finger, your second finger, your third finger, your fourth finger uh, in different positions. I tend to like second and third positions. Uh, definitely second if you're going to be doing fourth finger. And because fourth finger is a little bit weaker, use your third finger as kind of a crutch. I like to think of, for example, if you went uh, to the beach or a pool and you're to test your the temperature of the water, you would stand on one leg and then you dip the other toe or foot in, right? And so that'd be the weaker one. So I like to, the one that you're balancing on, the one that you're standing on is like your third finger and the one that you're testing is the weaker one, that's your fourth finger. So whenever I do third finger vibratos, I like to start with my third and fourth fingers as a half step together. And then as my fourth finger gains independence and strength, go ahead and start doing a whole step. And then as it becomes even stronger, you can even do it completely without the third finger at all. Okay? So, I hope this has been a good introduction to vibrato um, and a good refresher for those of you who already know it. And uh, it gives you a way for you to have a systematic way to rhythmize your vibrato for the best possible results. All right. Good luck. Thank you.